Hello, I am William Calvin, a professor at the University of Washington in Seattle, and this is the fifth lecture in the series, our kind of looking ahead, the evolution of higher intellectual function. The philosopher Daniel Dennett said, there is no step more uplifting, more momentous in the history of mind design than the invention of language. When Homo sapiens became the beneficiary of this invention, the species stepped into a slingshot that has launched it far beyond all other earthly species in the power to look ahead and reflect. So this time I'm going to cover six major topics. I'm going to start with groups as the setting for increasing cooperation uh, and some of the effects of group selection of making some groups prosper and others die out. Our mental life far exceeds that of the great apes and going better another So some of the major shifts that we've gotten from great ape behaviors uh, might be listed this way. Uh, first of all, there's the change to upright uh, two-legged stride, but the others are much more puzzling. Why did we get a threefold brain enlargement but it didn't start until 2.3 million years ago? So our idea of those major new traits prerequisites for other traits. Well, certainly high on the uh, psychologist list would be pointing and shared attention that the great apes don't have them and they are really needed for the development of many kinds of personal interaction that we have. Uh, mimicry ability, certainly uh, Without it, you don't get widespread tool use and a particular difficulty is tool making. Then there's the acquisitiveness that you see, particularly with learning nine new words every day in the preschool years. Uh, one other possibility is a prerequisite um, is being able to detect the direction of another's gaze, not just the direction their head's pointing, which chimps can do, but the direction that they're actually looking. Uh, all primates' eyes are brown, muddy brown usually. Whereas ours are white surrounding the cornea and iris. Do any of those uh, traits on the list move together? Well, certainly. We know that tool making and brain enlargement do not move together. Uh, brain enlargement is study after 2.3 million years. Tool making goes for one and a half million years without changing. That changes goes another million and a half years, etc. 
Then there is the matter that in primates generally, bigger group size is associated with bigger brains, as if it took more space in the brain to keep track of so many additional individuals. So that was a good count. Here's what happened to it. It was turned out to be an exception to the rule. During all the time the brain was enlarging three times, group size remained at the band level of several dozen. When brain size stopped growing with agriculture, that's when group size began to shoot up. That's two major proposals shot down by the patient accumulation of data by the archaeologists. Well, so much for group size as such. Now let's talk about groups as the setting for developing all the increased cooperation. And in particular, we'll say something about group selection, where one group succeeds at the expense of another going extinct. And we're going to start off with cooperation. Human beings are astonishingly good at cooperation. The International Space Station shows how far we've come. And herein lies a profound puzzle, because according to the standard evolutionary science that uh, emphasize individual competition between individuals. We shouldn't be able to cooperate very much at all, said Peter Turch. So the dichotomy between acting as an individual and competing with other individuals and the group perspective where the group is stronger if they cooperate quite a bit and therefore compete with other groups better is shown in this Dobert cartoon. Why do I keep taking on more work while you do nothing? That's because you optimize for group productivity while I optimize for my happiness. That makes you a freeloader. I prefer the label happy winner. There does seem to be an instinct to create groups even ad hoc groups, you know, they're done on the fly, like pick up basketball games and so forth. As Ed Wilson put it, we are compulsively driven to belong to groups or to create them as needed, which are variously nested groups, overlapping groups. In addition, they can be very large or very small. The original group, is the band of several dozen individuals, often a few extended families, that move around together. Uh, it can't be much larger than that unless the resources are really dense too. So it really looks as the hunter-gatherer lifestyle involved groups no larger than a few dozen uh, most of the time. It's about the same size as the great ape foraging bands. Uh, one of the things that goes with this is that the extended families uh, include adult females that have come from other bands and may have different standards about food sharing because of that. But you certainly have the band of brothers all related, grew up together, acting politically together, leaving the unrelated females politically weak. There's a notable exception in the bonobos. <laughs> With power scavenging, meat became available in large packages, whole hindquarters of zebra and wildebeest. But there was no way to keep it, and it was also too much for one family to eat. So the only sensible thing to do was to give away most of it and expect reciprocity when others next had excess meat. This setup is the major driver for food sharing, probably since 3.3 million years ago. Ed Wilson again, all normal humans are geniuses at reading the intentions of others. 
or why they evaluate, proselytize, bond, cooperate, gossip, and control. Each person working his way back and forth through the social network daily almost continuously reviews past experiences while imagining the consequences of future scenarios. So there's lots of social mimicry in humans and nothing in great apes. We even have unconscious versions of mimicry. Uh, we will do things called mirroring or echoing or matching where somebody else crosses their leg and you're talking to them. You may cross your leg in the next 30 seconds. Um, you tend to synchronize breathing with a conversational partner mimic their postures and intonation, even when you're dealing with a stranger. Uh, waitresses can use this to quickly establish rapport with a group by mimicking their accent and such. It's a good way to promote bigger tips as one study. However, <clears throat> People prefer to be with others who look like them, speak the same dialect, and hold the same beliefs. An amplification of this evidently inborn predisposition leads with frightening ease to racism and religious bigotry. Then, also with frightening ease, good people do bad things. So there's an interesting food growth curve from sharing. You can always share with more individuals. You can share more objects. You can share over longer periods of time. You can just keep increasing this. But sharing has the cheater problem at every state step up. You have to combat the freeloaders by shutting, excluding from the ban, and in the situation of the hunter-gatherer ban, being excluded certainly means your genes don't have a chance to reproduce themselves, and it also means uh, leopards can find you in the middle of the night with no warning from others. So people come with a fear of being shunned. I mean, even the Bible encourages it. Targets of shunning, said Ed Wilson, can include persons who have been labeled as apostates. It's fatal in the Muslim world. Whistleblowers, dissidents, strike breakers, or anyone the group perceives as a threat or source of conflict. So chimpanzees already have uh, the group moves for hunting small monkeys. I mean, they'll spread out to cover escape routes. And I've already described for you all of the army patrol behaviors of walking in single file, stopping, listening carefully, and then moving on, keeping the uh, youngster shushed, and so forth. I mean, this is a, um, a very interesting thing to see. Uh, Bonobos don't do this. Uh, chimps will patrol territorial boundaries, attacking solitary chimps from other groups if they find them there. Now, even if that individual happens to be a former member of their own group, it's a real gang warfare. You know, all the rules are off. Five on one attacks that rip skin and usually kill. There are deep instinctive fears of being otherized and forced out of a group. A lone free human would have to sleep without anyone to warn of nocturnal predators. On the savannah, one often sees a male lying alone, ribs showing. He is likely injured somewhat, but his big problem is that he got chased out of the pride and so is slowly starving. Hyenas can take prey away even from three lions guarding it.
So fear of dire consequences should one depart from the group's practices is often part of the glue that holds a group together. This doesn't take a policy for excluding people, as in excommunication. It only requires those instincts to punish obvious devi deviance, to treat them as other. Conformity is safer. Instincts can often be overridden by cultural practices, such as education, but it is a job that is never done because of the instinct which can resurface. Cooperation basically is unstable. It can be overwhelmed by cheaters who take but fail to give back. Keeping track of and punishing cheaters, even at risk to oneself, seems to be a deeply embedded instinct and probably arose well before Homo sapiens uh, at 200,000 years ago. And it's not just over food. I mean, consider those road rage responses for someone cutting into a lawn. So building up cooperative systems requires at least three things. One is moral goodness, a tendency, so the empathy to feel concern for and to help others. Moral evaluation, the ability to identify and dislike those who are uncooperative or unempathetic or unhelpful I mean, even pre-verbal infants monitor for fairness while watching others. And third, moral retribution, punishment of those who misbehave, even risking energy to punish them as in road rage. So these instincts for monitoring fairness in others uh, come about because basically everyone loves a freebie, but everyone, even infants, monitoring for sharing helpfulness when observing others interact. This is not learned, it's instinctual, and you can see it even in the capuchin monkeys. So foot sharing on the savanna built atop this earlier instinct to monitor fairness. People, that's egalitarian, emphatically so, before then. So the further compounding of groups, uh, the year-round farming villages, what's called tribes, uh, uh, when you realize that they only occur in the agricultural area, they've been calling them farming villages, of several hundred band members, chiefdoms of several thousand, these may have had to wait for agriculture. Human bands are mostly egalitarian. Leadership in the early villages is also weak without community building projects. It takes amalgamations of farming villages, chiefdoms so-called, before a real organization is seen. Monuments are built, a hereditary leader who has assistance and so on. This sort of thing is probably the last 10,000 years. So here you see it. On the left here, we see brain size starting at ape size down here, about one pint, and then it triples. And during all that period, group size is not changing a bit. You get to agriculture and between about 12,000 and 6,000 years ago, brain size drops by 10 to 17%. This is group size over here on the right, the foraging bands that are the uh, primal condition. Uh, then comes the uh, amalgamations of those that get up into the hundreds. Uh, we tend to call these um, farming villages now rather than tribes because they occur only after agriculture. Uh, simple chieftains and complex chieftains yeah, get you up into the tens of thousands are present before, agri before irrigation and before writing at 5,000. After that, grows to the tenfold in only 500 years. 
and another factor of 10 by sort of ancient Greek history time, 2,500 years ago. The 2,500 years ago would be uh, Pythagoras in Greece. I know. Ed Wilson again. Within groups, selfish individuals beat altruistic individuals, but groups of altruists beat groups of selfish individuals. Say group selection uh, favors altruists or risking the worst simplification. Individual selection promoted sin, while group selection promoted virtue. Our battle life, you can identify three stages of thinking. We can replay experiences offline. We can simulate and make inferences about causes, intentions, and logic. We can self-monitor and evaluate how these simulated experiences might lead to specific behavioral outcomes and see if they violate community standards before acting, generating alternatives, compare, try again. Hey. So let's discuss levels of organization and building them up another level. A level of organization is a concept that you see just how chemistry builds on physics and biochemistry builds on chemistry and so on. A four-level example that you all will understand. Uh, <clears throat> combed fleece is spun into yarn, which is woven into cloth, which can be sewn into clothing. Now, each of these levels of organization has been stabilized with ratchet-like mechanisms that prevent backsliding help really to define a level. Clothing is sewn, stabilizing the 3D uh, configuration. The fabric is woven, that's two-dimensional stabilization, into plane to prevent its disorganization into yarn. Yarn has been spun, linear stabilization, to keep it from backsliding into fleece. So we've already seen from last time a series of levels of organization. You see it in the infants creating categories for speech sounds, then compounding those phonemes into words, combining words into a short phrase, combining phrases into a longer sentence using syntax to help a listener guess the meaning, combining sentences into a proper story, I mean, all of this helps you think in greater depth. So let's start with all these categories for dozens, usually phonemes. Uh, so the Polynesian languages might stick to a dozen. Uh, there are other languages that have up to 50 phonemes. But those could be combined into a word. You can do lots of words. You can combine words into sentences, and of course there are infinite number of sentences. But sometimes you combine sentences into a story. Okay, basically the theme here is you're making a meta by combining your most recent uh, set of combinations. So you're meta going meta again, going meta again. Uh, all of these accomplish in the first three years, usually. Uh, and in the fourth, fifth year, the bedtime stories are really required to have a proper beginning, middle, and end to fit the child's mental template of what a good story, good story consists of. Of course, by the seventh year, you have another aspect. Uh, in the immortal words of my mother, well, you should have thought about that before you did it. As to say, seven-year-olds usually are held responsible for first evaluating the consequences 
and comparing it to alternatives and restrictions. So our metal life is much more than the notion of consciousness as just attention or awareness. Attention and awareness are what neurologists use usually. They speak of consciousness usually only in trying to explain something to the family. The higher intellectual functions all add structure. The beginning forms that we might share with apes or early pre-humans but all of them need quality improvements before acting upon them. There's a rather simple form of creativity, uh, which is just fiddling around, just keeping at it until you finally get it. Uh, but a lot of things have to be done a lot faster than that. And much of what we call creativity is the, uh, having just the right answer you know, to a question uh, and doing it very quickly, even though it's perfectly novel. Uh, but as you mull things over in the split second you might have, how do you get the assemblage good enough to be right? So on the first time out, it's correct. When you're starting with an assemblage of pretty random things, well, it's, you know, obviously once you get good at this, could make several plans, say contingent plans. Uh, but you can also create stories uh, in this fashion of offline thinking until you get it right. Stories. There is, however, this problem of stability. Every time you build a new level, you got to spend some time shoring it up so it doesn't just collapse on This brings us to higher intellectual functions. So syntax is the higher intellectual function that we've been talking about so far. Makes long sentences possible. Uh, you can even nest sentences inside sentences, uh, something like the Russian dolls. I think I saw him leave to go home. Has a total of four verbs in it. Not very long, but it's very structured. Planning, this multi-stage contingent planning, having plan B, a chain or web of logic that when they all hang together, we say we understand. In other words, we've successfully made a coherent mental model of the actors and the action. Other higher intellectual functions are things like games that have arbitrary changeable rules that you have to check your uh, tentative moves against. There's music, not the simple rhythm and melody so much as using multiple voices uh, where things have to fit together. And of course, coherence finding in general. Uh, we certainly use that in enjoying polyphonic music, but it's in general whenever we discover hidden patterns amidst seeming chaos. It's very reinforcing all oh, those little Eureka repeatedly as you saw, of course, crossword and jigsaw puzzles. But finally, complex thought, figurative speech, analogies, parables, those mappings between two stories. These are all examples of structured thought, and they all separate humans from the great apes. So to me, consciousness is an overarching word, meaning the higher intellectual functions, which are themselves all about doing novelty, structured novelty that is shaped up to high quality. In other words, creativity. Analogies are stretched comparisons. There are two ways to speak of them. The simile, where we say A is like B, and the metaphor, where we insist that A is B. You know, final week is hell. 
What makes human cognition so different from that of other primates is thinking in terms of relations, uh, particularly some new underlying order, as in that crossword puzzle. Uh, the neurobiologist Horace Barlow suggested that intelligence is about making a guess that discovers some new underlying order. And guess who well neatly covers the water ground relevant to the higher intellectual functions? Finding the solution of a problem or the logic of an argument, happening upon a appropriate analogy, creating a pleasing harmony or a witty reply, or guessing what's likely to happen next. Now, I know some of you are probably harboring the question of how do, how do you know they're not just thinking silently and thinking complex thoughts? Well, the scientist's answer to that is usually a version of, if you're so clever, why aren't you rich? Okay, um, what we would tend to think is that if they had complex thought, we'd see them doing things to their advantage even if they didn't talk about it. They already gang up on lone neighbors. Five-on-one mayhem is usually fatal. And I remind you of this to just show that they are certainly uh, <clears throat> violent enough towards other chimpanzees uh, to make these other stages possible. If they could plan a little after all, then advance to stage raids in the middle of the night. With more planning, that stockpile materials and practice maneuvers. They would advance to warfare. Now, I might insert at this point that warfare of this sort really wasn't possible, apparently, until the crops were in during the agricultural season and there was excess manpower available for a seasonal looting expedition next door. So there's little sign of chips having complex thought. We simply cannot detect any sign of our ancestors using complex thought in the archaeological record until behaviorally modern in the last hundred. So let me speculate a bit about the mental life of the pre-modern humans. Uh, that is to say, those that were earlier than perhaps 100,000 years ago. Now, we know that that mental life is not equivalent to that of chimps or bonobos, right? I mean, food sharing, those staying guard overnight, awake, I mean, those have developed along the line up to 100,000 years. Uh, the sense of cooperation suggests that not only being able to keep track of who is what to whom, building on top of uh, something that monkeys have, uh, was surely there. Uh, Bickerton and I estimated that proto language could easily extend back one or two million years. But the question is, this pre-modern human uh, probably had a more complex mental life. It just wasn't very complex. Uh, the best we can do is some of the neurologist stories about what happens when children don't have an opportunity to learn language of any sort. Uh, until late, and they have to try to pick it up then. Uh, so let me show you Oliver Sacks' story. Uh, Joseph was thought to be retarded when he was very young and placed in a home for the retarded. And it wasn't until he was about 10 years old that somebody discovered he wasn't retarded, he was merely deaf. So speech therapy started teaching him sign language. And by the time he was 11, he could actually be interviewed. So that's what Oliver Sacks, here's what he described. Joseph saw, distinguished, categorized, used. He had no problems 
with perceptual categorization or generalization. This would be common with great apes, indeed, most of the monkeys. But Joseph could not, it seemed, go much beyond this. Hold abstract ideas in mind, reflect, play, plan. He seemed completely literal, unable to chuckle images or hypotheses or possibilities, unable to enter an imaginative or figurative realm. He seemed like an animal or an infant to be stuck in the present, to be confined to literal and immediate perception. In my opinion, that's what pre-modern Homo sapiens was like. Sort of stuck in the present tense. Similar cases also illustrate that any intrinsic aptitude for language must be developed by exposure during early childhood to complex examples. Because his deafness remained undiagnosed, Joseph didn't have the opportunity to encounter phonemes, words, syntax, analogies, you know, during the critical years of early childhood. So far enough back, our ancestors were much like Joseph at 11. The short sentences of proto-language might not have given them very much in the way of complex thought. So the pre-modern mind likely had thought in Freud's elementary sense of trial action, but without thought structuring plus the bootstrapping of coherence, you cannot create novel sentences of any length or complexity, and you not, might not be able to think such thoughts either. So the question is really one of when things advance to complex thought in long sentences. It's not really a question of the bone tools or beads that sort of mark uh, the beginnings. So complex thought is sort of what Victor and I think came in at 50 to 100,000 years ago. If the six million years of ape to human evolution were made into a two hour movie, people thinking like us would only appear during the last minute of that movie. So, unable to juggle images or hypotheses or possibilities, unable to enter an imaginative, figurative realm, may be what pre modern Homo sapiens was like. Now, there are some minor advantages to that limited state of mind. Uh, wouldn't have worry, for example. I mean, you might dread another repetition once you saw it coming, but you couldn't worry about novel threats without a structured imagination. So just as what our ancestors, even the ones that looked like us, might have been like until real creativity appeared in the archeology. span of course, the question is how and what's stepped up, but let's just go back to the basics. Gossip is a prevailing subject of conversation. This is at Wilson again. Everywhere from hunter-gatherer campsites to royal courts, the mind is a kaleidoscopically shifting map of others inside the group and a few outside, each of whom is evaluated emotionally terms of shades of trust, love, hatred, suspicion, admiration, envy, and sociability. So my, my model for the transition is that when a few exceptional adults in a band provided enough examples of structured gossip, who did what to whom, etc., to be overheard by two-year-olds nearby, Two-year-olds grew up able to surpass even their role models for complex speech and for planning and creativity as well. That, I suspect, is when things pick up, picked up in the So before this outbreak of structured stuff, you'd have still words, short sentences, intentions. 
But after this early childhood exercise of listening to who did what to whom gossip, you might start producing more long sentences, more complex thoughts, contingent plans, games of logic, music, coherence finding, creativity. At Wilson again, it required the ability to invent and inwardly rehearse competing scenarios of future interactions. The social intelligence of the campsite anchored for humans evolved as a kind of non-stop game of chess. We evaluate the prospects and the consequences of appliances, bonding, social contact, rivalries, domination, deception, loyalty, and betrayal. We instinctively delight in the telling of countless stories about others, cast as players upon our own inner stage. Today, after this transition, we tend to see ourselves as the narrator of a life story, always situated at a crossroads between past and future. Looking ahead, we imagine various paths because our less imaginative ancestors couldn't think about the future in much detail. They were trapped in a here and now existence, and much of it in the first person of Alternatives may float around in your subconscious, but they are poorly assumed. They need variation, evaluation, then more variation and evaluation until you finally rate them as good enough to go with. So let's address the incoherence that comes before coherence. We know this from our nighttime dreams. Things often don't hang together properly. They are full of people, places, occasions that don't fit together very well. That is to say, they are incoherent. I mean, you know, think of those dreams where, say, you've seen Aristotle and Einstein riding a tandem bicycle on the deck of a sailing ship listening to rock and roll. Rock and roll, of course, describes sailing ships. They are just a mix of players and places without a script or identification tags. So let me take you through some stages of uh, incoherence. You start out by just juxtaposition. I'm going to use art history examples here. So there's a sort of a competition between two possible realities that you get from uh, this uh, sculpture from George Segal. Real incoherence. I mean, here's Salvador Dali trying to depict a dream caused by the flight of a bee around a pomegranate, which is down here at the bottom illustrated, one second before awakening. And you see not only this impossible elephant water walking back here, but you see a couple of tigers, one of which is chewing the tail of the others, but they seem to have emerged from a fish that emerged from another pomegranate. Here's Max Ernst's version of incoherence, 1920. You have to look at this a while before you realize these are rafter beams up at the top, and this is flooring down here with some moss accumulated through and hanging from the ceiling are birds, dead birds. Except this one on the right strangely develops into below this line a man on horseback waving. And the woman without a head here still has her hair, but it's being shaped into the stock of a gun, which her left arm seems to have become. Uh, complete with a little bayonet on the end or a cleaning rod. Uh, heavens knows what some of the other stuff is. But the suggestion here is that your mental life is subconsciously like this. You may not be able to report on this when you're awake. 
Uh, but as soon as we have these dreamlike things, they're always circulating in fragments that bump together, sometimes fitting and binding, and becoming more coherent. So you can get things that are almost coherent, and this Magritte is lovely. I mean, it's coherent until you notice that the arm is being painted here. And of course, you can finally get to almost coherent, where it's just incongruous. I mean, that is to say, uh, the male here is not responding to the female's advances, possibly because he is inanimate. So true coherence would look like this. That is to say, everything hangs together. The male and the female are correctly oriented. Sufficient notice is taken of gravity. I mean, it. Everything fits together just like a photograph. Indeed, given that painters ask models to hold a pose for many hours on end, this probably was painted from a photograph. So we're now down to creativity's problem of assembling all of this into something of real quality. And You need structuring for all the higher intellectual function. Regular exercise from gossip, perhaps the creative explosion at 70,000 years ago, could have been long sentence language being picked up by those more flexible youngsters who then excel because it becomes part of their heart soft wiring. But the hard part is that you need creativity for novel situations something to bootstrap quality from incoherence as you get set. Perhaps just to speak a sentence you've never spoken before. Well, there are mechanisms that bootstrap nonsense into coherence. Uh, Darwin machine is such a mechanism. Years ago. So the problem with creativity lies in shaping up these initially incoherent fragments to yield high enough quality to act upon. A sentence that's good enough to speak out loud. So you need a process, something like Darwin's, that transforms the random beginning assemblage into something of quality. That systematically weeds out the not good enough incoherence. So what sort of on-the-fly process that can operate in a second or so does it take to convert such an incoherent mix into a coherent compound, whether it be an on-target movement program or a novel sentence to speak aloud? The only quality-enhancing process we understand is that of Darwin's process for species evolution. As Darwin and Wall showed for new species, random beginnings can slowly yield quality improvements using a competitive process that judges the gene's suitability to the relevant environment. And so the question is whether the brain can use a Darwinian process to improve a plan in just a second or so using a memorized environment to the judging. Now, there are six essentials for Darwinian process, and I'd love to go through them all for you in the abstract, but I'm going to have to settle for just giving you an example, and it's a rather outre example. That is to say, I'm going to tell you how history comes about, and that it represents the Darwinian process at work, as I suspect other cultural examples would have the same analysis. But I'm going to use what we think of as currently as history, out of textbooks, etc. I'm going to discuss history qua history. 
I mean, what history includes and leaves out, how these change over time. These standards of historians provide us with an example of these six essential Darwinian ingredients at work. Number one, of the many happenings, some are captured in pattern sentences that describe who did what to whom, why, and what means. Two, some of these patterns are not only captured, but they're retold, they're copied. Conversation. Number three, this often occurs with little confusions. You substitute one thing for another, or there are conflations where you sort of superposition of two stories and you get them confused. Four, Alternative versions of a story about a happening compete for the limited time of campfire storytelling or the limited space on bookstore shelves. Fifth, there is a multifaceted environment that affects their success. The association of described events to those of instincts and memories of everyday life so good stories fare much better in the memorized environment. Good stories have a beginning, middle, and end, of course. Uh, but finally, and I, I say that this is Darwin's natural selection, this number five. Got to have all the others in the Darwinian process, but this is what people are usually speaking of. The environment's multifaceted, it's got the right uh, resources, it's got the right setting for reproduction, it's got the right defenses against predators, all those things. Uh, it's sort of like grass growing in your backyard and what's the ratio of uh, bluegrass to crabgrass? And is the crabgrass taking over the lawn? Depends on how often it's been cut, how often rain falls, how often you get dry periods, all those things lead to more crabgrass, less bluegrass, and so on. And similarly, good stories fare much better in the memorized environment, especially those conveyed by historical novels that strengthen the narrative aspects give a proper beginning, middle, and end. Uh, it's so much easier to memorize these and recall them. Finally, you have to have the sixth essential. If you want to see evolution because of this, you've got to have this one. Finally, because historians rewrite earlier historians, we see Darwin's inheritance principle in action. New variations for the next generation are preferentially based on the more frequently copied of the current generation of historical stories, it's simply because there are more of them. So you do the variations primarily upon the crabgrass and less on the bluegrass and so on. Final uh, page. Just out of beta and our, our problem with limited rationality. We have a status quo bias, a tendency to keep doing what you've always done is often stronger than the rational arguments for changing course. We get stuck in a rut. Secondly, people endow their possessions and paychecks with inordinately high value simply because they possess them. This is related to the fact that people feel the pain of a loss of one of these three times more acutely than the joy of a gain. One reason why future gains are hard to balance against the loss of present day spending money. The haves turn conservative with age. So people have a tendency also when faced with too many choices to decide not to decide. 
uh, there's a great deal of trying to sow confusion, for example, about climate change to make it so complex in people's minds that they'll just decide not to decide what to do about it. So another way that human rationality is biased can be seen in the results of some interesting experiments. Uh, so setting up groups and then asking them to answer questions about how they would, what they would do in the situation. Group membership means you judge your fellow members of the group by a different standard than others. Uh, some people act as if they want to be on the winning side. If it looks like you're going to win, uh, you'll ignore unethical behavior in order to stay part of the winning group. So do what others as you would have them do unto you. Sure depends on contemplating a novel course of action, imagining how others might feel about it, and then deciding whether to cancel or pursue. But well, you can't have a long list of rules about these things. Uh, you don't have to imagine all the rules, but just judging the situation means that most ethical behavior depends on imagination regarding novel situations. We are clearly in new territory. These abilities that are most unique to humans haven't been around very long, probably only the last 1% of up from the apes evolution, or the last 30% maybe of the times of Homo sapiens. They aren't certainly gene-encoded uh, instincts yet. And we now live in circumstances unlike that of the dozen space bands of our pre-agricultural ancestors. I mean, if there's another societal collapse, reversion would be all too easy. Just out of beta is a term from computer programming that says your program isn't really finished yet, but we're going to let you try it out anyway. And usually there's still hangups in it where you can't get out of a trap or something. Um, and you have to reboot your computer, maybe. I mean, beta testers put up with a lot. But I'm afraid that's what humans are like. Uh, the imperfections, the hot button kinds of, of things that may completely bypass our rationality, encourage us to ignore facts, those are all sort of facts of life at this point. A hundred thousand years really isn't much time for natural selection to get the bugs out, particularly of something that operates at such a high level within those levels of organization. The bugs have certainly provided back doors that allow political marketing experts to exploit us via hot buttons that bypass our rationality. I'm not going to say more about this now, but I will hope in some future lecture, after I've written most of the book, uh, to try out on you my assessment of the and down again aspects of Up from the Apes. Uh, and at the moment, it looks like this. Looking ahead at our two existential crises, one is the threat of autocratic government as to say democracy in name only. Uh, these sort of governments restrict freedom, abandon the 99% of people who aren't rich, and ignores the climate threat or anything else that might interfere with profits. Number two is the threat of a large, large population crash of the human population. It's not something that will wipe us out and make us extinct so much as it would dig a very big hole for the 10% to climb back out of. And it, it's so easy for something like this to happen because we have not invested, no other society has either, past, in really shoring up 
the system so that we can take big perturbations. Uh, the reason it's so easy is we now have so many people living in cities that depend upon food grown out in the country. And cities just don't keep a stockpile of anything around. It's certainly not the you know, seven years of grain that the Pharaoh kept around in case there was a uh, another drought. So with only about a two-day two food supply, anything that disrupts transportation into the city, fear of contamination, another part of the truck drivers, for example, any of those things can make the cities collapse. People flee into the country and things only get worse. Societies have collapsed at least 22 times in the past. Uh, take a look at Jared Diamond's book. So this is not a trivial concern, but no one really seems to talk about it. Uh, they'll just argue about emissions uh, controls, making things a bit better and so forth. The, the real threat here is an instability that causes our civilization to go away. So to end on a more cheerful note, here is Paul Gauguin's 1897 painting that hangs in Boston. And that little orange blob up in the left corner of it has those three questions. Where do we come from? What are we? And where are we going? My first three lectures really address the where do we come from aspects. Uh, these last two lectures have addressed what are we and where are we going? To close, I'd like to quote Dan Dennett again. We human beings, unlike all other species on the planet, are doers. We are the only ones who have figured out what we are and where we are in this great universe. And we're even beginning to figure out how we got here. So thank you very much.